Please join me in welcoming Justin Baldoni. Thank you, Courtney. Oh, it's so awkward when you read all that stuff about <laughs> yeah. someone and you're there. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can we just take a moment together to just breathe and just have, I don't know how I'm going to moderate this panel now. I'm a wreck. Um, <laughs> I was oh, wait, sitting out there crying. You just watched the movie. <laughs> we just watched it. Oh, and I just want to have just, just, yeah, we just ah. watched it. I just want to have a quick moment of silence just for those who are dealing with cystic fibrosis and other illnesses, those who have lost their lives, those who are fighting the fight right now. I'm a mess. Um, just take a moment with me and let's just breathe in the space, okay? <sighs> That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank um, you for honoring everyone just like that. It it's so funny. I came in, I, you know, because I've been doing press all day for the movie. Yeah. So I came in with a totally different energy yeah. than this whole room. <laughs> I see. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was like racing to get here. And I was like, oh, wait, you just watched the yeah. movie. So <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to, yeah, just How's have that How's everybody feeling? <laughs> that was deep. Did you like it? Oh, thank God. <laughs> it was. It, it was really good. And congratulations on the movie. Um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Dorea, like Dorea Sunshine. I'm trying to bring the sunshine back. Um, it was beautiful. And, you, and you, I don't know if you were, how much you saw, but it was amazing. We were ooing and aahing and crying and laughing. And there were just so many emotions. And it was really incredible. Um, so, you know, we all know you probably as Raphael from Jane the Virgin. Um, and so I just want to congratulate you on directing your first major feature film. And I just want you to kind of tell us here, Justin, kind of what that was like and, and what is it about this film and this story in particular that made you want to make that jump and come behind the scenes? Oh, uh, that's a multiple part question. Yeah. Um, I'll get into the the reasons we made the movie. So, uh, believe it or not, we have, in one way or another, Google to thank for all of it. So, I, I gave up acting and this career that I thought I wanted when I was, you know, about seven or eight years ago to start a documentary series that was paid for by YouTube uh, via Soul Pancake <laughs> called My Last Days. And, uh, and I basically traveled the country and I told the stories of incredible individuals who were living with a terminal illness. And my prayer was that by doing this show and by spending time with these amazing people who were choosing love and hope and happiness in the face of tremendous adversity, that maybe we could all learn how to live and learn how to live from people who were literally dying. Even though technically, of course, we all know there's a clock. This was, this was, it's in your face. And of course it ended up becoming one of the most watched documentary series ever on YouTube. And then we ended up selling that to CW. And in season two of My Last Days, I met a young woman named Claire Wineland, who was a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. And Claire Wineland um, had cystic fibrosis. And I told her story in the second season of My Last Days. And her and I became very dear friends, and she kind of became like a little sister to me. And, uh, and it was in a conversation with her when she told me that two people with CF can't touch. Because I had actually, I, I had asked her afterwards, I was like, all right, let's, now that the, the cameras are not rolling, tell me about boys. Yeah. Like, tell me some boy stories in the hospital. Like, have you ever dated a cf -er? And she was like, what, no. And that's how I learned that this was a real thing. And I just knew that it was a film. Um, and I had also, interestingly enough, back to the YouTube thing, I had set up another movie based on another documentary that I had made on this young boy named Zach Sobiak, who had also um, had uh, terminal cancer and wrote a song called Clouds, right, which ended up going very viral. And there was a time when I didn't know which movie was going to happen first, but we developed this um, with Claire and, uh, and injected a lot of her soul into the spirit, because as you, you know, I don't know if you knew who she was, but she used her platform on YouTube that Google gave her 
uh, to have conversations that were uncomfortable about life and about death and about happiness and not being defined by the, 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 what the world puts on you and not being defined by her illness and having her illness be a part of her story but not all of her story and making her life a beautiful piece of art which is something that I think we can all relate to which I really tried to infuse into the film. And as to why I chose to go behind the camera, I was always, I felt, meant to be behind the camera. But as you know, when you come to Hollywood, they put you in the box that they want to put you in. Um, so uh, I was put in the, the acting box first and then did everything I can to use that platform to then transition to tell the stories that I feel like I was put on earth to tell. Thank you, and bless you for that. Uh, I follow you on Instagram. You're just a light, a light. And because of that, I also followed Claire. And I remember watching her stories and her videos and sitting here watching this. Uh, Stella's character reminded me a lot of Claire, how she you know, documented her time. Um, and so it's funny to hear you kind of say how, you know. And Claire helped us develop the movie. Which is beautiful. And Claire is no longer with us. Yeah, we lost Claire. Uh, I'm going to try to not get too emotional. But we lost Claire uh, just before I finished my director's cut of the movie. Yeah, thank you. So this was beautiful. And I think that one of the most uh, special and beautiful parts about this movie is that we have an element of computer science. And that's how we were able to partner together. And Stella's character is actually the one who codes the app. Yes, that Rachel uh, uh, co-created that we'll get to in, in a moment. Um, but yeah, wanting to ask you, like, how did that come about in, in, in bringing, Google. bringing the CS Media? Tell us more. <laughs> um, so partly through you and Courtney. Um, so uh, we had, through my company Wayfair, created a show uh, that we had been working on for quite a while um, uh, called Project Upgrade, mm -hmm. which was basically giving, uh, trying to make STEM sexy essentially, and cool for your young women. And so uh, my good friends, the Merrill twins, we brought them on. We created the show with um, DeRay and Courtney. And, uh, and, and through that conversation, I was having a chat with Courtney, and I sent her the script and um, just for some thoughts of ways that we could all collaborate. And she wrote me back and said, hey, um, there is because originally when we, when we had first written the script, we had made her... Um, she was, of course, obsessive compulsive, but she she did everything on paper. Yeah. And so it was it was like in spreadsheets, and it was on paper. And and Courtney had the idea of like asking if I would be open to doing it as an app. And I said, that's hell yeah. I said that's even better. And it was fun because then we got to like adjust the character a little bit. And that just goes to show you how important these initiatives are, mm -hmm. right? And your and what you guys were literally hired to do is to consult and work with people like me and say, hey, would you be open to this? This is an initiative. We want to get more young women and girls into STEM. Let's create a character that does it and not make it a big thing. Make it like she just happens to do it, right? Because that's how you change things. You need to be able to see yourself on the damn screen. If you can't see yourself on the damn screen, then you don't know that it's really possible unless, you know, you, it's just embedded in you that that's an option. I can do that. And I just said, that's, yeah, so we just, we changed it immediately and worked on it and got some even fun moments, like when she's coding and Will says, like, wait, you built an app, right? <laughs> and a little bit of that, like, yeah. hell yeah, I built an app yeah. kind of moment. Um, and then the next fun part was, I was like, let's really build an app. Let's not just say it, but let's do it. Because right. it's so important for me that we're mirroring what we say. Right? It's one thing to say, we all know these companies and all these people that are like, oh, we'll do this and we'll do this. And you see these advertising campaigns and you name it, right? But it's like, who's doing it? And I think that's how change really starts in our business is we have to do it. So we said, let's really build an app yeah. and make something that people can actually use that have chronic illnesses. Yeah. And so we were connected with these amazing young women um, who dove in and designed it and built it. And now there's gonna be an app, right? That's right. And it's just, and that's so cool. Thank and hopefully you. it will be useful. That's right. Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? And I know you were able to build and design an app that made it into a feature film, which is incredible. You did that with your partner, Lavanya Singh. Just tell us a little bit about what that experience was like. It was amazing. <laughs> um, so Google reached out to Lavanya and I um, in October and asked us, how would you feel about building an app for a movie? And we were like, that would be amazing. <laughs> um, 
So basically, we got to talk to Justin, and we got to talk to Courtney, and what we uh, determined was the design for the app through that, and then we built the, what you see in the movie first, and we're continuing to build the app right now, and it should be released by the end of March, which is really exciting. That's amazing. And this is Lavanya. Lavanya's here in spirit. She is caught up in midterms right now at Harvard, no big deal. So, uh, so hi, Lavanya, if you're watching on the live stream. Hi, everyone on live stream. But let's just show a quick clip uh, about uh, the app that, shook, that was, shook, was showcased in the movie. It's their real code. Awesome. Yeah. And I think we have some stills of the app too, correct? Can I just say that I love that she gets frustrated by a bug? I know. Thank you for making it realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So, so tell us, like, what inspired you to want to get involved uh, in, in the film and in creating this app with your friend? Um, so I was first exposed to computer science in sixth grade in middle school, and I uh, was interested, but I wasn't super interested um, because I didn't really feel like it was pertinent to my life that much. I was just coding something where like bunnies were running around on a hill. Uh, it was very <laughs> silly. And then when I was in eighth grade, I discovered a website called Code Academy where you can teach yourself how to code through tutorials. So I decided to do the build a website tutorial and um, basically was blown away by the possibility of being able to create something that could impact a lot of people instantly. Um, so I continued teaching myself how to code throughout high school. And in terms of this app, um, I think that I actually got to talk to somebody with cystic fibrosis through this process and hear about their experience and all of the medications that they have to take. And um, setting reminders is one thing, but I also think it's useful to have something that actually reflects your own experience, whether that's a film or whether that's an app, um, where it's actually catered to things that you need and there are like really specific details that um, coordinate with your life really well. Amazing, yeah. thank you. And I'm just curious here in the audience, how many of you are interested in technology or computer science? Oh wow, quite a few people. How many of you are into tech and computer science or you're kind of interested in it but you feel like you don't belong or you haven't quite made that leap yet, there's some hesitancy? <laughs> okay, well hopefully you feel inspired to do it, right? No matter your circumstance, you can do it, right? Like Courtney was alluding earlier, I mean, if you can see it, you can be it. And like I, when I was growing up, I was really good at math and science. I was really tech savvy, but I was never exposed to anyone who looked like me doing it. And I shied away from it. And now I'm very fortunate to be able to advocate for it, right, for people who want to do it. And so, you know, I think we're all up here today to just encourage you all to continue that. So thank you, Rachel, for being a pioneer in the space and for creating that app. That was amazing. I mean, I was floored just seeing that in a major film. So congrats to you. Thank and uh, Justin, thank you for, for highlighting it. And I mean, you use your platform all the time to, to you know, showcase these social issues. And we've seen it with Man Enough and My Last Days and Project Upgrade, which you talked about uh, with your partner, Farhoud uh, Maybodi, and you worked with Courtney on that. And, and that's a YouTube series um, that's, you know, up on the platform for free that everyone can watch and it stars the Merrill twins and they're working with a diverse team of female engineers to build a digital interactive mirror um, and so you're just phenomenal and I want to know ultimately what motivates you uh, to then encourage women to pursue STEM like what what motivates you to get behind that cause so deeply I mean it all it all stems back for me to faith. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I was raised in the Baha'i faith. And, I mean, it all comes, to me, to me it just all comes back down to the female education yeah. and the empower. I mean, it, literally in my faith it says if you have two children, a boy and a girl, but you can only afford to educate one, you educate the girl. And, uh, and wow. because that's how you change the world. So, I, I mean, it's not like I grew up thinking STEM, I gotta get young women and girls into STEM. It's when issues are presented to me and my privilege allows me to then 
amplify uh, a cause or an issue that I feel is important. And it's tricky because there's so many things that need amplification. Um, and you can't take everything on, but you know, piece by piece. And uh, this was, I have, a, I have a young daughter and you know, I would so be cool. so happy and thrilled to see her end up like you. Oh, and, thank and, you. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I don't know, I guess it, it all stems down to faith and why are you here? What are you doing with your time? And yeah. Amazing, thank you. Speaking of women in STEM, we have the phenomenal Kim Swinnon over here on the end. Um, and you actually were featured in Project Upgrade. And you worked really closely with you know, other amazing women d working in tech fields all around. Um, so just talk to us a little bit more about that experience and kind of explain a little bit about your role here at Google slash YouTube. So um, yeah, I was really grateful to be able to contribute to Project Upgrade. It was an awesome project. Um, a couple of us were sort of industry mentors for the Merrill Twins and the group of college students that they were working with to build this app. Um, and the filmmakers. <laughs> and yeah, well, <laughs> fair. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I work on YouTube. Um, as Courtney mentioned, whenever you hit that big red subscribe button, which was featured in the movie, um, <laughs> some of my code runs somewhere in a data center. Um, and uh, yeah, I came to computer science kind of circuitously. I started out in entertainment. I was an actor in Hollywood. Um, I, I was not placed there. I was trying very hard to get there. <laughs> um, but I actually realized that I, I'm, I've always been really drawn to math and science. And uh, this notion that you get to build something and, and to have people use something you built and sort of make an impact in their life with that over and over and over again is just a, a totally different kind of satisfaction to helping people feel something or discover something. So I still love to do both. Um, but that was sort of my trajectory to get to computer science. And I think it's been really uh, a blessing to be at Google where we have so many effort to try to encourage girls and young women and underrepresented boys to be interested in computer science because I, I empathize with the difference, the gap between how it's portrayed in the media and how it is in real life because I was sort of exposed to both sides. So. I love that. And I want you to speak more about that because when I first met you, I was so inspired by you because we share an acting background and I was like, wow, I'm so glad that she does both, right? That they're not mutually exclu exclusive. And that's something that I really try to preach at Google is, right, you can do both. And just can you talk a little bit more about that? And, and, and what, what made you say, no, I'm going to do both. I don't have to split it. I think a lot of people are afraid, right? They have you know, the left side of the brain, they also have the right side, and they're creative, and they want, and they want to find those intersections. How do you go about that? Yeah, and, and so to be clear, I get all the time, uh, oh, you're both right brain and left brain. How weird. <laughs> why are those split? I don't know why that's... Um, I've also gotten, oh, you're too pretty to be a software engineer, which is a weird compli -salt. Um <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> compli -salt. Yes. Oh, yeah, backhanded compliment, compli <laughs> um, uh, Yeah. So, so yes, it is, it is absolutely possible to do both. Um, and, and to be really clear, I was terrified. <laughs> um, seriously, and I think it's important to like make that be known, right? This, it's, not, it's not an easy field, but it's also not, uh, it's hilarious to say this, but it's also not rocket science. Um, when I joke with my friends at like SpaceX, they crack up with that. Um, <laughs> So like, I say that because I think a lot, of, um, a lot of, not just girls, but young people sort of try out tech and computer science and science, and they find it hard. Mm. And the first thing you think is, I must just not be good at this, mm. right? And unless you have those people, and in my case, it was my ex-boyfriend who was a software engineer when I started thinking about what else could I do in my life besides acting? Could I actually do this for real? I'm way too old to get into computer science. I was in my 30s when I decided to go back to school. Um, it takes that one person being like, no, no, you got this. What, this is not... This is not as hard as you think. Like, just push through. Try to understand it. Get the help you need. Get the support. Um, it's totally doable. Mm -hmm. But I think we get so many of those messages that that this is intimidating and it, computers are hard and confusing, and and we kind of take that in and assume that that's the limiting factor. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. And what about you, Rachel? What are some mis 
you know, miscommunications, misconcepts that you've heard about STEM and, and you know, did you ever fear or did you have a fear to, to pursue it and what are some things that you had to push against? I was never really afraid to code or afraid to do math and science. Um, I feel like I was raised in an environment where that was like, there was no question as to whether that was something I could do. It was I could do it if I wanted. However, I did naturally gravitate towards reading and storytelling um, when I was little. So for me, um, coding is not something that I'm naturally good at. I work really hard at it. But I also think that nobody's really naturally good at it and everybody has to work really hard at it. So I think knowing that like, you do have to um, keep going even if it's difficult and you might be confused for a while, but then you'll figure it out, I think is really important. It's important in life too. Um, I also think there's a huge misconception that you have to be good at math to be good at coding. Um, I like math, I don't love it, um, but I don't really use that much math when coding. I think coding's really logical and it's based off of principles like loops and recursion and um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's so true. We all get these misconceptions about tech and computer science, right? Like, you know, Courtney and I have worked on shows like The Fosters and Silicon Valley and Miles from Tomorrowland and Easel's High. And, you know, Kim has been an amazing engineer who actually, you know, uh, helps us write the codes for a lot of those shows, right? And now we have Rachel and Justin, and we are getting all these partners to really change the culture and perception around tech so that once people do come to places like Google, we can retain them once they get here, right? That's not a pipeline issue, the pipeline is there, but what are the messages that we are uh, you know, sharing with, with the world? And that's why I think media is just so important, right? Because right now, if we were to look at TV, uh, and I think we're making some progress, but you know, we think it's only for you know, cis, straight, uh, white men or you know, Asian men with glasses and acne and no personality and no friends and they sit in closets and eat donuts all day and type on their computer. And it's like, no, a computer scientist or engineer can be anyone, right? It can be everyone and, and we need to think more inclusively. And so I just commend you both uh, uh, for kind of going the distance and, and pushing its obstacles and for you, you know, just to be such an incredible ally in the space. It means so much and I think that you are encouraging you know, the next generation you know, to to think differently and to be man enough and you know to stand up for what's right. So I just you know want to thank all of you for that. And I'm just wondering what advice what advice would you give? Um, you know, looking back on on your on your journeys and your experiences, what advice would you give to those uh, here? Maybe some young women uh, or uh, just anyone who's underrepresented um, in the space. Those on live stream. You know, what, what would you tell them? Rachel, start with you. Um, I would tell them that you don't need to feel like it's something that is not for you because it is for you, but it's how you apply it to your life in terms of it being um, related to you. Um, for example, like I developed this app related specifically to cystic fibrosis and other illnesses, but like the fun part of it was not the coding. The fun part of it was the impact and, the fun and what was going to be created at the end. Um, for me, coding is about the it's not about the process, it's about what's being created, but the process is needed in order to create something. It's kind of like if you're um, directing a film, you have to know about cinematography, but the camera is not the thing. The film is the thing that you're watching, and coding is similar in that way. Um, I would also say that there are other girls who do it. They might not be around you. There are a lot of programs that um, connect girls who are interested in coding, like NC Wit, um, Girl Up. Uh, there's a camp called YSI, which has applications out right now, Code with Classy. Um, <laughs> there are just a lot of opportunities for girls to get involved in STEM. Amazing. Mm. Thank you. What about you, Kim? What would you add? Well, I, I actually taught at YSI last year. Um, I went to YSI. Which one? In Malawi. Oh, that, okay. Yeah. I taught at the one in Namibia. So for those who don't know, yeah. YSI is... Um, a partnership between the United States, uh, the U.S. State Department, and an organization called Girl Up, which is a campaign of the United Nations Foundation, and it brings uh, girls from different countries together to learn STEM not in the U.S., so when I attended, it was in Malawi, and there were 20 girls from the U.S. and 80 girls from six different African countries. Um, it was amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it was, <laughs> teaching there was phenomenal. I mean, the range was some girls had already learned some code and some girls had never touched a mouse and they were all helping each other to learn. It was like one of the most inspiring, awesome experiences. And by the end of it, they all had an app that they'd built. Wow. 
So like, um, again, not rocket science, right? Like you get, you get a group of people together and inspire them and like, it's, it's, it's just trying it out, see what works. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would add would be, um, don't be afraid to break things. I know that sounds kind of interesting. Um, be a little afraid if it's YouTube. Um, but, <laughs> but even that, like, I, I mean, honestly, that's, it's something I, I kind of had to learn the hard way. Yeah. And I was never really taught to tinker as a kid. And in my, I, as my education was very much about like memorize the right answer and spit it out. Mm. So I kind of never got that experience of like see what works and try it and if it breaks, oops, well at least I learned something. It is such an invaluable thing to be willing to do in engineering because you learn so much about something by breaking it. Mm. Um, so, so it's just part of the process. If you break it, it's not that big a deal unless it's YouTube. <laughs> yeah. But what about you, Justin? Like, anything that you would share um, just in terms of those who might want to pursue STEM or coding or anything that... Yeah, when I graduated from Harvard um, <laughs> with a degree in uh, rocket science. <laughs> By the way, I love that. My, one of my favorite parts of your story is when you're like, when I joke with my friends at SpaceX. Because <laughs> I just kind of was like imagining you talking about things with your friends at SpaceX and me on the outside just having no clue what you're talking about trying to follow the conversation. We're, we're often probably not talking about anything that, that that's that high level, to be honest. Well, in my mind, you are. Okay. I'll take it. Um, uh, I was so, in, I was so in, entrenched in their questions. What, what was my question again? Like, I was like with them. And I was thinking about how do I translate that into talking to my daughter What would you about tell stuff? Maya? Yeah, what would you tell Maya? I would, I would connect her with them. <laughs> Number one, Some and you. Connections. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question for you, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want people to take away from, from your film? I mean, watching that, I was just like, wow, I need to live more. I need to get out of my phone. I need to be in the moment. I need to go home and cuddle with my boo bear and, 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 and just live and dive more into art. I love just how much, you know, how much art was in that and just how much living they did. And it, even though, it, you know, they have a terminal disease and... It was beautiful, and I just want to know what what do you want us to take away from that? Uh, that. Sorry. No. Uh, Say more. <laughs> like I think when you make anything, you build anything, you hope that it has impact, and you always want to design or build or create something with an intention, right? And um, for me, the intention was as simple as if people leave this film and feel an urge to call someone they love and just tell them they love them, then I will have succeeded. Or if maybe they can re-examine their relationship and realize that, wow, it's not all about physical touch. There's more to it. You know, we live in this shiny, glossy, on-demand society where we constantly like project out to the world the way that we want to be seen instead of really who we are. We swipe for love. We, we, if it's not working immediately, there's so many different options and we can just choose. And I think that I just wanted to create a grounded love story that just kind of reminded us that there's so much more and appreciation for life. Because I think, you know, if you don't have a chronic illness, like everybody suffers, everybody has things that are uncomfortable, you know, knee injuries for me and muscle things, and there's always something, that's life, right? But I think that in general, what so many of us take for granted, others are fighting for. And it isn't like, oh, poor them at all, because what it, from my experience, they're the ones that teach the rest of us how to live and be joyful. And... uh and so, yeah, I think it's just perspective. Yes. If there's a word, it would be perspective. And, and I hope that it does that. And please tell all your friends, because uh, movies like this need support, especially on opening weekend, or the studios won't trust people like me to make them anymore. Um, so, yeah. What do you think? Did Justin succeed, y'all? Yeah? yeah? So good, so good. Well, we have a few minutes, so I do want to open up to the audience right now for questions. Uh, take a minute. 
We have uh, the, Courtney the mic. here has Box. a mic that she's going to throw at you. It won't hurt. The bravest. Who's going to ask the question? If anyone has a question for our panel. Wait, that's a literal mic you can throw? Yeah, we have one so right you, over here. You, so you were saying you can drop the mic? <laughs> <laughs> that's called Do a I dad just, joke, well, everybody. Into it? <laughs> okay, I'm going to stand up. Okay, hi, I'm Kavita. Um, and I guess I have a question for all of the panel, but I guess um, Justin specifically. Um, when you were making this film and you really had to think about the difficult discussions within it, um, what struggles and what hurdles did you have to go through in order to make sure that this movie wasn't patronizing? It wasn't about, oh, poor them. It was empowering, and its message was both effectual and impactful. Yes. Mm. It's a really it's a it's a really fine line and a tricky balance and one that I thought I was failing at the entire movie. Um, you know, again, because it was because my friend inspired me to make it, it her soul, Claire's soul, I feel is a huge part of this film and her whole purpose when she was alive was to redefine what illness looked like. So for me, this was not a movie about sick kids. And that's kind of unfortunately the way the world projects the, their view of it. This is a movie about regular teenagers who just happen to be sick. And I think that is the, the most important like, perspective of the film is that like, this, there's no romanticizing of an illness here. This is just who they are. That's right. And it's as natural. This is why the first 10 minutes is just seeing them in their environment so that you never have to go back and see it again. And that was another thing. Like, I wanted to show it up top and then never reference it again. And you just know then that that's part of their life. So even if you move on, you know that she's got to do her treatments or she's got to do that thing because no one wants to see that the whole time. And in terms of the difficult conversations, I have found that the people that I'm the closest to in my life, I've had very difficult conversations with. And I've also noticed how afraid our culture is of having difficult conversations. So I intentionally designed this film to be uncomfortable in certain areas to hopefully inspire people to get comfortable having difficult conversations. And if you notice, the scene in the movie where they connect the most starts in the worst way, yeah. which is the the confession of the death of her sister and how it happened and the guilt that she feels with it. And if you think about like the, the line that the scene takes, it was very intentional that it started off that way and that it ends in the most romantic, intimate way you could ever have it end. Because those two things are not mutually exclusive, but yet I think as a culture we say that they are. And it was, uh, it was honestly, it was hard for the studio. It was hard, I mean, th this, you gotta remember, this studio, like, they are ballsy to let me go make this movie and to have, like, this conversation in the romance scene. And I had to explain why. And that's why it's so deep. That's why it's like you watch it and, and, and there's no sex scene in the movie, but it's far more intimate than if there were. That's right. And that scene, honestly, and that scene starts with, the death of her sister and then it lightens up and then they connect and it lightens up and then they get closer and and that's life and that's just what I've noticed and that's what I've learned from a lot of people that are in this situation my wife and I the closest some of the closest times we've ever had have started with pain and there's just not things that you see in these movies and I just wanted to make something that's like real and like no it's like we're like this is, it's okay you can just because you're convert like on a date if the conversation it gets heavy or deep or dark or depressing. It doesn't mean the date is bad or the person's not right for you. Keep going. What's on the other side of that uncomfortability, right? And we so often, like, we're so quick to write things off. And I don't know. I just want us to, like, fight for things a little bit. So, anyways. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Someone was in the back. I saw a hand. There she is. You can just throw it. Just throw it. Go for it. I got to get one throw of those. It. I need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, can you hear me? 
Hi, yeah. everyone. My name's Joey. I'm a computer science and theater double major at Middlebury College. Yeah, you and are. My question is for Kim. Um, yes. So you said that you were in the film industry um, for a long time. My question is twofold. How did you transition from the entertainment industry um, to the tech industry? And how did you find an intersect intersectionality between them? Because it's something that I'm struggling to do, but I want to do in the future once I graduate. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> um, I, I will I give you two answers. So um, in terms of transitioning, to, to, be, to be fair, because it's, it's more dramatic if I'm like, I had no math background. I actually was a huge math person growing up. So I did have a lot of exposure to, to math and science. Um, I didn't major in it in college. I did take a couple computer science classes. Um, so 10 years later, when I decided to get into the field, um, I knew I probably needed to get a master's degree or at least a second bachelor's to convince people to hire me because just a theater studies degree might not cut it. Um, and uh, uh, to be totally honest, I convinced UCLA to let me in. <laughs> and, and by that, I mean, I got a ton of no's. And being an actress in Hollywood, I said, forget that, I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, I followed up with the vice chair and said, take a meeting with me. And I sat down with him and I showed him my transcript from undergrad. And I said, you tell me what I needed to be to, to be competitive and I'll do it. Um, and so he basically said, okay, ace your math GREs, uh, take these classes, audit them, ace them, prove to us that you can handle the material and we'll go from there. And and, and what it took was basically just the, you know, help me make this happen, but I'm gonna make this happen. Um, so I audited classes for a year and then I got accepted into the master's degree. And that was a two year program. And then Google hired me out the gate, which is awesome. Um, That's great. <laughs> and thank God. Um, <laughs> uh, so then in terms of uh, intersectionality, I will tell you one of my, sorry, that was a misuse of that term. In terms of the, <laughs> Forgive me. In terms of the intersection of computer <laughs> science and theater, um, uh, one one anecdote that made me feel really at home at Google very fast was uh, orientation. You go up to, to Mountain View and you uh, do a week of sort of preparing on classes on the infrastructure. And uh, the lesson they had us do was, I kid you not, indexing the complete works of Shakespeare. And I was like, I'm, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in terms of how I've tried to like carry that forwards, um, part of it was working on YouTube, to be totally honest, because that was like a neat way to combine. Um, and what I'm doing right now, like getting to, to be on stage and use my performance skills to try to encourage other people to get interested in science and, and show them that it can be fun is actually one of the ways that I've gotten to, to do both. Um, and I've worked with the CS and media team for a while and I got to be on a PBS kids show, for example. Um, or there was a, the LA Olympics promo. They were like, hey, we need a, a female software engineer on camera. Do you know of anyone? And they're like, actually, we have one and she has a SAG card and an agent. So, <laughs> um, awesome. Um, so there are definitely ways and I'm still looking for all the new ways. I, I, I would be delighted if you went out and found the thing that, that hit that sweet spot for you, and I'm sure it exists. Yeah. And, um, and keep using your influence, right, to, to keep spreading the knowledge and go to production studios and talk to them about what you want to see on TV. Right, like Courtney and I also have a web series called God Complex, uh, and our executive producer's in the house, Claire Brown in the back. And, you know, that's something that we, that we did, and we got engineers like Kim to advise on it and make the coding, like, authentic and accurate, and I also got to act in it, right? So it's, like, really cool to kind of see those worlds intersect. So keep keep creating, right? If it doesn't exist, create it and like find your own lane and do what makes you happy. You don't have to choose. Thank you for being here. I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> oh, we want to be like you. What are you, double major in what? <laughs> Computer science and theater. Yes. You have a question right here? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Danny. Um, I'm a junior in high school and I'm not sure I think other other people in high school. Any other high schoolers? Don't leave her alone. Don't leave her hanging. All right. Yeah, okay. Um, and I'm sure we're all thinking about colleges, and I'm very interested in a wide range of topics. And it's it's hard to kind of distinguish what you want to do as 16 year old, and it's kind of hard to make that decision, especially what topic you want to go into, do you think it's more important to focus on your the community that you're going into or the the 
value of the education system that is going to. What do, what do you think, Madam Harvard? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, so I uh, went into this, I'm a freshman. I went into this year saying I want to possibly major in either computer science, sociology, or gender studies, because those are three things I'm interested in. Um, and right now, I feel like I want to either create my own major, which specifically focuses on the impact of technology and media on society, or I'm going to be a gender studies or sociology major with the computer science secondary. So I'm taking two computer science classes right now, and I took a computer science class last semester. But I think you don't have to choose between things you're interested in. There is a way to work everything together. It just might not be the most traditional route. Um, but I think there's a lot of power in that as well, because I think when you're really specific and intentional, you're going to a, get the most out of it, and then B, um, that's where like the magic happens, and that's where special things will happen. And let me throw in that you're not going to get trapped by your major, <laughs> right? Because same thing, theater studies major, I'm now a software engineer. Like, so you, you get to change your mind. And I think it's really common for people of multiple types of careers now. It's so true. When I first went to Dartmouth, I was a biochemistry major, and I wanted to be an obstetrician and deliver babies. And then I would go, I'd, you know, go to the NICU, and I'd cry every time. I was like, "You are not Meredith Gray. Abort mission." <laughs> and I switched my major from biochemistry to sociology and theater. And I work at Google. It doesn't matter. Do what makes you happy, and then everything comes naturally. And you can find ways to, to work your passion in with your studies and your degree, but no one's like, what did you major in? No one really cares. Just do what makes you happy. It's true, they don't care, because I didn't even graduate college. <laughs> there you go. But don't take that route. <laughs> it's so much harder. <laughs> <laughs> but he makes feature films, okay. Any other questions? Two more? You have one right here, and then one right here. All right, hello. Um, my name's Maya. I'm also in high school. I'm a Maya. senior. Um, anyways, so I'm taking CompSci this year, CompSci A. I really like it. Uh, anyways. What is uh, that for those who might not know? It's, it's an AP computer science class. It's one of two that's offered, I think, yep. generally. But th there's, there's a really competitive stigma with computer science. Like everyone I know who codes is also very competitive in coding. and. Um, there's kind of a push to get straight A's and to do what you're good at so that you can get straight A's. Um, and so how do you suggest kind of reverting from that stigma? Because I like computer science, but I'm not fantastic at it yet. I'm not saying I'm not going to be. I'm just saying I'm not fantastic at it yet. But how do, how, like, how do you suggest pursuing something that you enjoy and being able to reject that idea that you always have to do something that you're good at? That's a great question. That is. Yeah. You just put it really well yourself. You just, you have to reject the idea that you have to be good at it right now to do it. Like coding, like I said, coding does not come naturally to me. I'm definitely not the best um, in my computer science classes. I'm definitely not getting straight A's. I can assure you of that. But I am trying really hard and I am getting better. So I think you do have to trust in the process a little bit and know that you're not going to be perfect and it's going to feel kind of hard and you're going to be kind of mad at yourself during the process, but you will get better. And also, um, I think straight A's aren't everything and they also don't prove what you've made. And I think something that's been really helpful for me is knowing that like I can create things that don't have to do with grades that have to do with coding because um, that's when I feel most empowered is when I'm creating something that will actually have an impact. I, I've discovered the hard way you don't get an A at your job. Um, <laughs> like, I seriously, I went out of grad school being like, all right, how do I get an A? And I, I almost literally had my first one-on-one -on -one with my manager where I was like, okay, what's the assignment? And she's like, no, no, this is the problem. You need to go figure it out. We don't have the answer yet. And I was like, oh, this is a different ball game. <laughs> so like getting an A, in school you're sort of trained that that is the goal, but like in actual engineering, doing side projects, doing things that inspire you, like getting your hands dirty, that's so much more valuable in the long run, so. Great, we have a question right here. Who has the mic, yeah. Good catches. Um, I'm Delilah, um, I'm a sophomore in high school, and my question is more geared towards um, Justin and like the whole like filmmaking process. And um, I love all of the talk about like intersectionality and how like 
one thing just doesn't define you. It's like so many things that are just meshed together. And I mean, they're separate still, but, and I was wondering, I know that in trying to bring representation to um, different groups, um, it's kind of hard in like mainstream media to, um, to make something and just have it like be like an undertone. Um, and I was wondering if you got, well, if you got pushback and like how you deal, you dealt with that. Um, Is there a specific pushback that you're asking about by uh, chance? Ju not really. I think it's just, just in like, general. Yeah, more open for you. Um, I think. I th you know, look, we are we are living again. I go back to the times that we're living in, right? And you're living in a time where there's keyboard courage and everybody has an opinion, and. I come from the belief where there is n there you cannot make everybody happy, and there are, there are people that don't want to be made happy, Amen. and there are opinions that are just th existing for the sake of opinions, and and uh, and there's always going to be pushback about anything and everything. I mean, I, the perfect example is like how could one of Clara's videos ever get a dislike? But there's, there's a hundred people out there <laughs> that click that dislike button. Uh, you know, I'm, I'll never forget Zach's mom when I made the documentary about Zach Sobiak, who died right before the documentary came out, or right after the documentary, like within a day. And like there was negative comments, mm. and and it and it just made me realize that th there is nothing that anybody can make that someone will have only positive opinions about. And again, then you look at film critics. What is critic, <laughs> right? It's not like there's a job for film supporters or, you know, it's just they're critiquing, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, it's just the culture we live in and also everything is so instant that it's like, well, I can just get my thoughts and opinions out into the world without thinking about them now and just ruin somebody's day and then go on with mine. Um, so. There, there was absolutely there's there was pushback in the CF community by a couple people, right? And again, it's up to me then to go and say, well, why is there pushback? And what I have to remember is, like, this is life and death for a lot of people. That's it, right? And so, representing, there's never been a film about CF before, so the CF community needs to own it because it really it was made inspired by them and for them. But I won't be able to please everybody. But at the same time, I have to remember, and you know, my friend Gray here in the studio, and my publicist and my assistant, like, the, you know, I I am a people pleaser. I want to please everybody all the time, and my mom always told me, you'll never please everybody all the time. Um, you just need to worry about having me be pleased. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, <laughs> you're taking it too far with the Jewish guilt, mom. Uh, <laughs> but but really, so there's so yeah, we strive for representation. You know, you you know, and you you. You try to be inclusive and come up with these ideas and create a film that isn't just over the top, you know? Like even down to, you know, I struggled for a while because I just wanted to have diversity and be inclusive in the way that I cast the movie. And I found myself in certain times like, like do I just find, like, you know, because I didn't, you don't have the options to just cast whoever you want. And then, like, you know, you're not, a, there's times you can't go, it's not PC to say, like, I would like to bring in only African American people for this role because then you're thinking, of, well, crap, I'm not thinking about the Asian community or the Middle Eastern community. Or, and then you realize, like, oh my God, now I'm, now I'm discriminating against, and it's like, oh shit. <laughs> and if you go down that rabbit hole, it'll, it'll actually prevent you from doing anything. And that's what I had to learn, was, was like, I'm, I know I'm going to disappoint somebody, um, but I tried. And we took baby steps. And, you know, um, yeah, that, that's kind of like how I approached the whole thing. I love that. So we're out of time. That's a great note to end on. Just keep oh, trying. Raise your hand. I feel bad. Oh, you have a question? No, 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 it's fine. It was like a is quarter it, raise. Is it, it quick? Like a, it was like a Real quick, one last one. Quick Go for it. Real quick. Okay. Um, my name's Sophia. I'm a senior in high school. Um, and my question was, one of the most interesting parts of the film for me was the conversation um, that was had about like how to pay for the health care and what you do um, when you're over 18 and it's not covered. So I was wondering, um, like, what was 
for Justin, what was your intention in putting that in the film and what conversation? Yeah, thank you. I'm so happy you actually noticed that. Uh, because nobody's seen the movie yet, I don't know what people are going to respond to or like if what tr things are going to be put in there. So originally Poe had a whole backstory that I wasn't able to include in the film because I wanted, first of all, I wanted, I, and again, skating on this line, like on the razor's edge, like I wanted there to be a character that was a representation for an entire class of people that are currently struggling with the medical system in America. And so um, without getting too deep into politics, I wanted Poe to be a dreamer um, because we wrote the movie at a time when dreamers were being attacked. And, um, and I wanted people to be able to empathize with somebody that was a dreamer. Now, it's very hard to do that when you have a secondary character who's also a marginalized group on a couple different sides. And then he's literally like, he's just checking every box. And I was like, I can't, I just like, it doesn't work, right? It just becomes too much. And it's my desperate attempt to try to like make, like make this film more than just, it, look, it's already doing a lot, but it's like, how, I, I always go like, how can I do more, right? And then you realize like, I can't do more because then I'm just gonna push people and then it's just gonna be like, it's gonna be a whole group of people that just think I'm pushing like a liberal agenda and I'm not and it's just a whole thing. So Poe was originally a dreamer and his mom had, uh, his mom had brought him here for medical care because um, it was better than um, where he was from and then she was deported. That was the backstory that was cut and there was a scene that's in the deleted scenes of the movie when it comes out on iTunes, you'll be able to watch it between, uh, it, that takes place in a chapel between Cole Sprouse's character Will and Poe um, that gets into a little bit more of the fact that his mom is no longer here and he's gotta pay for like his medical care himself and then Will was rich so he made a joke about like, well maybe I can help you. Um, and it was just a way of saying okay, there's more to this character and there's, there's consequences to being uh, sick in the current medical um, the, the world that, that we're not really paying attention to. Um, so that's why I put it in there. And then we did little things, like he had a different oxygen tank than the other two. You might not notice it, you might notice it, but that was important to me. He had an older iPhone, right? Like little things that you may notice or may not, would that, those were the things that were important to me because what nobody knows is the oxygen tanks that Will and Stella are carrying are $15,000. Right, and you can't get those if you don't have insurance. And this kid, you know, he's being paid for by the state, and that's why it's a real thing. And he has guilt, and he doesn't want people to pay for him. And it's, a, you know, and those are all the things that they have to deal with on a daily basis, and that millions of Americans have to deal with that we never talk about. So it was a, it was an attempt. So it makes me really happy that you noticed it, because I did unfortunately have to cut a lot of that storyline to make room for things. Thank you. Yay, okay, so everyone, go see the movie on again. March 15th. Please, go see it again. next Friday. Bring your friends, tell people about it. This is so important, I can't stress it enough. This type of film with this much diversity and inclusion and acceptance and love and respect, it's epic and we don't get it enough. So let's give our panel one more round of applause. Thank you all so Thank much, you, Kim, Rachel, Justin. Thanks to Courtney, our production team, all of our volunteers, all of you for showing up and staying late. I know you all have homework. Go home, do your homework, get ready for work tomorrow. We're gonna take a quick photo, and if you all could kindly pick up your trash and find your way out to the lobby, uh, I'm sure some of us will stick around to answer some more questions. Nice to meet you in person.